Hello, hello. My name is Sylvia, and I'm here today to interview my partner in blessing, Nick, um, so that he can share with us the man behind the name and also the idea behind MCR, which is Miami Community Radio. Hi. Hi. Long time. How's it going? Um, thank you for accepting this last moment interview. Um, yeah. I received this vision of, of interviewing a few people that are part of my family. And um, I wanted to interview you. First of all, I wanted to ask you something that came to mind like a few minutes ago, which is, why is Nicholas your name? Who gave you that name? And what does it mean? All right, it's a little intense way to start. Uh, so thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for applying. It's the first time that you actually apply for a show in two years of us operating. Um, it's cool. I'm still waiting for your DJ set, your debut DJ set. But we're not live on Instagram. We need to go live on Instagram. Okay, share. I mean, while I'm going to take your phone. Um, yeah, it's a really intense question, but the reason why I was named Nicholas is because um, my parents were assaulted by a pair of very strong and violent people. Um, outside of my house when my mom was pregnant and pretty much they got the uh, shit kicked out of them uh, specifically my mom was on the floor uh, being beat up by two women and my dad came out and saw what was happening so my dad is like into martial arts and he's a, a character. He's quite the character. Um, and so he beat the shit out of the people that were beating the shit out of my mom. And he sent them back home bruised. He took out his staff because okay, he's like okay. a purple belt and like okay. whatever. Like See, he never got black. The, the, the point mom. is, is that, okay, the point is, is that my mom got the shit kicked out of her. When uh, she was pregnant. When she was pregnant with me. And then my dad came Which out. Which was already like a miracle because she was not supposed to. This is right outside of my house right. in, in Little Havana. Like outside of my house on the sidewalk with the bodega active, right? Right. They were most likely buying or selling drugs like Coke. And uh, they were parked in front of our house, which is why this happened in, in our driveway. And... Um, so the reason why I was called Nicholas is because my mom was feeling really bad. She had this intuitive thought that I was going to die inside of her belly while she was pregnant. And she, these are her words and Anita's words, which is my grand, grand aunt that lives with us. Shout out to Anita. Um, uh, the guy, the nurse, the ER nurse that saved my mom and saved me apparently, put his hands on her stomach and she felt a ticklish sensation. And um, she said, what did you just do? He didn't reply. And he just smiled at her. And then she said, what's your name? And he said, Nicholas. And she said, thank you. And uh, that's why I'm called Nicholas because the person that healed me inside of my mom's pregnant stomach during this whole altercation outside of my house. Um, his name was Nicholas. And yeah. they went to the hospital afterwards and they weren't able to find this guy called Nicholas. Well, you're missing a staff. few steps there. I'm missing a lot of steps, but I'm trying to summarize a really intense yeah, story. But the most important part is the fact that when she asked where is Nicholas, the, the nurse, there was no Nicholas there. I just said that. You said that? Yeah, on staff. When they, when they went to the hospital oh, staff, they okay. asked who was... Where okay. where is this person Nicholas to say thank you for saving our child's life and they couldn't find okay. this person? So it's divine Nicholas. intervention. That's that's where your name comes from. And what does it mean, Nicholas? 
A victory for the people. Okay. In Greek. So that's where I want to start. Um, because you're literally embodying the victory of the people. And then I wanted to ask you, for those that might not know, where the idea of MCR came from. Because sometimes we think like we need to be in a good place or we think that ideas come from good moments or from the light all the time. Um, but in reality, it might not be that. It might, ideas might come from dark moments. And um, you know what I mean? Like, it's okay, they can see you. Um, so where does yep. MCR come from? Like, why, why did you get the idea? I know that it's together, you, Philip, and Maurice, it's not just you, but specifically you, when did you feel like the calling of MCR, when did you receive the idea of creating something like this? What, what happened that pushed you to create this? I have to think really hard about this. Um, no. Yeah, really? because uh, 11 years ago, actually 12 years ago, I was in my senior year of high school at Academy of Arts and Minds in Coconut Grove, the charter school that saved my life. And, uh, and it it's now closed. They went bankrupt. Classic art school trauma. Um, I created, when I was a senior, this platform called IRL URL, and there were three editions of it, and it was at Sweat Records. And I would live stream on my shitty Dell um, that had, I think, one gigabyte of RAM on it. And the live stream crashed multiple times. But I tried my best to broadcast and live stream the event. I did all the programming. Uh, I booked a lot of friends of mine from high school and outside of high school. But yeah, that was kind of like my first foray into online internet broadcasting. And there's a, an article that Kat Bien, she's like a really talented journalist. Now she's like a, an editor. She's friends with Zach. Um, shout out to Kat and Zach. But uh, Kat wrote an article about that and... Um, so that was kind of like the first, that was like the prototype. And then uh, the real, I guess, quote unquote, inception of MCR was, I'm gonna leave her name kind of anonymous. Uh, I'm gonna leave her name out of it, but I had a falling out with a major artist here in Miami that I've known for many years. And uh, I think this was like three basils ago. I helped set up, I put up the fake walls. Um, you know, she had me exhibit one of my art pieces, one of my conceptual art pieces in the space. I got really close to her team. Um, and then I was like, oh, I know someone that has speakers and, uh, you know, a DJ controller, you know, can we do some music? And she said, sure. And so we did that. Um, but I think she misunderstood the length of time that we were gonna be doing that for. So um, I told her the whole week and she understood like one day. And within those seven days during Art Basel, there was pretty much open decks happening every day. And this is literally on Second Avenue. So um, we had a lot of people from the community just hop on the decks. We even had people walking down the street and plug in. And we met a lot of really amazing people because of that. Um, and it actually attracted people, an audience, into the gallery itself because the gallery had very low foot traffic. So the music actually attracted a bunch of people into the gallery. Um, so what was the reason of the falling out? The reason of the falling out was because she had so many different dinner parties and brunches and other events that she was exhibiting at that she didn't even have enough time to go to her own exhibition that she was paid to do, which was the one that I was exhibiting at because uh, she was the curator for that show. Uh, it was a group show. And um, the falling out happened because she didn't want music to be played throughout all of Basel. And this was totally free. There was no fees. There was no, like, it was just asked my friends. My friends came. They set stuff up. And we just gave people. But was there a problem with the type of music that you were playing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it wasn't even me. It was... Um, 
now someone that's a little bit more well-known here in the city uh, that was doing open decks and they had just started DJing back then. But they accused that person of playing space music that sounds like club space music, which is so far from the, from the truth. Um, they were playing UK Funky. They were playing uh, Jack and House from New York. I know that space plays that sometimes, but not always. Um, they were playing jazz music. They were playing, playing funk music. Um, so they, just the accusatory kind of position. There was also a third party involved. It's like a very rich, like, uh, like crypto uh, funder. Yeah. So um, I think it was like a triple Scorpio. Doesn't really help the situation because he, he really thrived off of the energy of conflict. Um, and instigated a lot of stuff. He, I mean, he's actually the reason why it all happened. But anyways, the point is, is that sometimes uncomfortable situations takes place in order for uh, shifts to happen and for things to be created. Because if there isn't crisis or if there isn't difficult times that push people to uh, radicalize themselves and like elastically expand and be flexible, then they're just used to the same nine to five monotony of, you know, uh, self-destructive habits and, and not actually being ambitious and manifesting their dreams. So I'm actually grateful to that friend uh, or ex-friend or whatever kind of weird relationship we have now. I don't really talk to her. She doesn't talk to me. Um, and I think the full circle there was when I was walking with my friend from Berlin in New York City. Uh, we were in Brooklyn and I literally saw the fucking guy on the sidewalk. We're talking about a city that has like millions of people, right? Like every day, like the foot traffic is, what are the odds that you, s s you come, you, yeah, you stumble across the person that you met two basils ago. And what happened when he saw you? He freaked out. He's like, what? Like he, he couldn't believe it. And I, you know, I apologized to him. I said, you know, um, there was just a huge misunderstanding. He apologized to me. He's like, I don't know why you're apologizing to me because it's completely my fault what happened and I'm sorry that your relationship with your friend fell through. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a huge manifestation where it's like, okay, the universe is asking for me to close that chapter. Um, so MCR started from, really, really from that, not directly, indirectly, but... Um, I think that's, you know, because it was Mauricio's ex-DJ, it was Philip helping set up the sound and, and reaching out to, to people from his community for them to spin. So this is, again, like another prototype or a, a V, you know, point zero 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 one of, of what we have now. But, um, yeah, I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but that's more context. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's important for, for people to know um, that you can get stuck into the victimization and victimize yourself for what happens and the circumstances, or you can just empower yourself and decide to do something with it um, rather than stay stuck in the victimization. So I have another question, and if uh, people have questions, they can put them in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna ask Nick whatever question you have uh, on whatever topic. Um, so I want to ask you something because MCR was born in April, correct? It was in March or April when you, it was in April. Uh, so we launched in April, but it was a pre-launch. It wasn't the official launch. Okay. The official launch happened in January. Um, so yeah, technically the pre-season started in April. Okay. Which was supposed to be purely experimental, and we didn't know if we were going to do this long term, and we're like, okay, right. we're just going to try this out to see if this works. So, yeah. So, um, that's when we're going to go a little deep into that. Where did it start? Where was the lunch? I mean, you know this answer. I'm going to let know, you answer I this one. I know. I, I would like for you to share with, with people so that we are archiving the history of MCR locations. Location number one, where MCR was launched. Our apartment. Where? Specifically Mirta's apartment in Little Havana. Shout out to Mirta and her family. <laughs> yes, uh, because they allowed us to, to have music, very loud music there. Um, and what happened there? Why did you change location? 
Because of you. Why? Because we had a baby. And what does that mean? That means that we need to be in bed early. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying that. I was kicking everybody out, basically, <laughs> because I'm like, this cannot happen. People entering, going in and out of the bathrooms and just like smoking and having good, a good time outside um, and music very loud. So, um, but that was also useful, right? It was necessary, yeah. And, and I knew that it wasn't forever, but it pushed me to have meetings and reach out to people. And like, I was surprisingly mind blown by how many people wanted to help. Um, so yeah, it was completely critical and necessary for that to happen. So thank you for kicking us out. And uh, before going to the second location and third location, I wanted to ask you, so did you have an initial uh, mission statement for yes. MCR? Did it change? Yes. Okay. Can you go in deeper into that? What was the initial mis mission statement? What was the initial um, purpose of MCR? To record and archive performances in the city. That, that's it? That, I'm trying to summarize like three pages worth of <laughs> right. stuff that we wrote down. <laughs> okay. But and um, so was it more like performances, like general performances, or was it just DJ sets? Uh, no, it just like event coverage in general. It didn't really have to do with, um, it was... Free? Or freer? What do you mean, freer? Like it was not just one type of thing, just like just DJ sets, just DJs. Well, no, I mean, it, you know, there's there's ICA and Paris Art Museum. They do a great job of, uh, at least nowadays, uh, archiving their panels, like their talks, right? Um, but we didn't have anything DIY or independent that was recording panels and talks. Um, so it didn't really have to do just DJing uh, and nightlife culture and, and rave culture. It had to do with it's just lack of or poor media culture um, to support the nightlife culture. And then you had the journalism, which would take a few weeks. There's like a jet lag there versus like instantly having the recording. And it's no longer like hearsay. It's like you can actually relive the experience. You can see what the lighting was like. You could see who was wearing what. Uh, you could hear the, the music. You could see who was drinking what, right? Who was smoking what. Um, okay. It's just different when you're looking at video and audio versus just words in a journal. Hmm. Um, so the purpose was to archive. Yeah, the purpose was to archive, but also to educate and to uh, prepare people for the industry because there's a complete disconnection between like uh, learning stuff and then actually being booked for the thing. Uh, so one thing that I talk about every you know, initial season launch meeting is like, I ask everyone, raise your hand if you know what a W9 is. Raise your uh, hand if you know what a, a invoice is, right? Um, and no one, like most people don't know what those two things are coming into MCR. And by the time they leave MCR, they know exactly how the system works. Um, were which, you able to give opportunities to people through MCR? Or were people able to get opportunities through MCR? I mean, you're, you're asking me questions that you already know the answers to. Yes, but, of course. Um, yeah, like Art Basel. So it worked. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it took a lot of sacrifice to get to where we are. But When you um, say sacrifice, what are you thinking about? I'm talking about uh, energy. I'm talking about time allocation. I'm talking about resources, not just myself, but also Marisio and, and Philip. Shout out to Marisio and Philip. Um, also, volunteers from residents. You know, in our old space, we were way more autonomous, and we're going to transition back into that soon. But all the residents that volunteered for operations, early and late shifts, uh, in our office space, but also at events, I think that's helped out significantly. Um, so having early late shifts from residents just shows how much they love us and how much we love them, you know, in terms of the trust uh, that we have with them. But yeah, no, it's 
going back to your question, like it, yes, it was about platforming and, and, and archiving and educating, but it just became so much more than that, you know. Mm. Um, where did the name? Th where did the name come from? What do you mean? Miami Community Radio. I know it's very simple. A yeah, simple it's name. just it's simple. It's it is what it is. Like it's just it, yeah. And how did this, the um, the statement change now? Because you said that it changed. Yeah, like I I never thought I'd be researching for hours about like housing assistance and like developers and like displacement statistics and and like there's so many things that I. Why are you interested in that? Because we don't like our family doesn't have. A, you know, like we're we're staying with family. Like we we're we're displaced. Like <laughs> so, like when you're solving problems because you're suffering from them too, it's like oh, like okay, I can do this. Hmm. So you were able to do something with the market. Yeah. Do you rem I remember that that was an idea that you had that you never thought that was gonna be able to come true, and through meetings and connecting with people, you were able to. The what at the market? Well, no, it's not that I never thought it would come true. I knew that it would I, happen at some point. I, I thought it was never going to Oh, you thought it was never going to yeah. happen. Oh, well, thanks for telling me. <laughs> That's great. I guess you learn something new every day. So what happened? Um, what happened was uh, I approached someone that did a group. But it was actually a solo exhibition. It wasn't a group show. Did a solo exhibition at the old office space where they took the entire office and put fucking tin foil <laughs> and like reflective materials. I'm like, what the fuck is this? I'm in some type of like mushroom universe and like put custom lighting everywhere and put their artworks hanging up. Um, it was spectacular. It was the, the most mind blowing interior design work that I've seen, honestly, next to like, uh, Alexis and, and Logan and, and Santi and some of the work that they've done at these warehouse raves, but because that that's just amazing the installations that they've had set up there. Um, so you talk with somebody there. R Rizo is the person that I spoke to, and Rizo still works at the Viscaya. Um, well, not just Viscaya, but Urban Oasis Project, which is a a farm. And uh, from that exhibition, that solo exhibition that Rizo had in the space, and I got to connect with him. Uh, we spoke, we had one follow-up conversation. I just sent him a text. I'm like, hey, are you willing to just talk things over? I'm thinking about having a food assistance program for, for our residents. Um, you want to just give me advice, like what direction I should take and, and how I should approach this? And he said, sure. And then that kind of transformed into like, oh, would you actually want to like partner on this? And he's like, yeah, let me talk to my boss about it. So I had to wait like a week um, ish. And he's like, I'll make the formal intro on an email thread. And then did that. We had a Zoom meeting. I got to know him. Um, and then Art, his name is Art. Shout out to Art. Um, and then he's like, yeah, we do it at Vizcaya. You want to do it at Vizcaya? I'm like, sure. So we had a meeting with the Vizcaya team, and that took about a month, a month and a half. Uh, that was Ian at the time. He, I don't believe Ian is with Vizcaya anymore, but thank you, Ian, for helping out with that. Um, so between Art, Ian, and Rizo, that's how all that manifested, and it was completely through bartering. There was no... Yeah, they can see your face. Oh. There was no financial exchange. It was just service to food. So what does that mean? How did it work? What, what that means is that you show up with a USB as a resident, an MCR resident, uh, or records, if you let us know ahead of time, and you perform, you DJ for half an hour, and you walk away with mushrooms, uh, with fruits, and with vegetables, a box full of whatever you want. You tell them what you want. And they just give it to you, completely non-GMO, no Monsanto, you know, Gates Foundation 
cool. injected stuff. It's just like real food. And um, yeah. And so now what what is happening with the house assistance thing that you're you're thinking about? What what is the plan? Do you want to share it? I don't want to overshare, but um, I'm doing a lot of research and I'm working pretty deeply on this document. I think I'm at three pages. Uh, I think it's too long. I think I need to word things better, but it's going to be a bartering agreement for residents. So they pretty much perform for five hours a month and that pays for their rent. So. And that would be a three-month lease agreement. So they would perform where? They would perform at the hotel or at the um, the apartment complex because there's a lot of apartment complexes that are co-living, co-working, and there's just going to be way more of those here in Miami. Uh, the structure is really popular here. So... But performing there, they would, a few hours, they would be uh, bartering, basically, their performance for the stay. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what I'm saying is that, based off of my research, it's about anywhere between $1,800 to $2,300 for a studio apartment um, in some of these complexes. So the, how the math works is that it's $500 an hour. Those are my calculations per resident. So with five hours a month, that's $2,500 in bartering value. Um, and that takes into account like association fees and maybe they have a pet or something or they have a parking spot. So whatever the 1.8 or you know the, the $2,000 for the studio apartment eventually turns into like 2.5-ish. So you're trying to make the artist not a struggling artist anymore, a thriving artist. I'm trying to create a parallel system than the one that we're in versus having to degrade my values and my ethics. What do you mean degrade, for example? What I mean is like caving into the easy way out and just saying, okay, this is how things have been done in the past. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have a lot of confliction when I build and then saying, no, fuck that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna be conflicted. I'm gonna have really deep and integrated partners and I'm gonna build with them. Like it's holistic, it's not isolated, it's not insular, right? Um, so I think when you approach building from that standpoint, a lot of magic happens that we can't really fully understand. I think um, some of the sacrifices that, quote unquote sacrifices, because that's not the right word, um, some of the things that you have to say, say no to are opportunities that you could have taken just for yourself and the type of person that you are is that you are always bringing somebody with you, like sharing the opportunity with somebody else and saying no um, to things that do not feel like resonant to you. Um, so this is the question of $5 million because it's 333. Um, if you had a genie lamp and you could ask for three wishes that could help you fulfill these dreams, what would be the first wish? Be careful. All right, the first one, I'm taking this directly from Aladdin. Uh, I'm gonna set the genie free once I have my two wishes. L-O-L. And then, so I have two wishes left. So the first one is, um, uh, having the choice to come back to this planet, like having the choice to reincarnate, right? Because I had that in the past. I think we all did, whether we remembered or not. But like, once I die here, it would be great to like see or view future memory fragments. Um, and so I'd probably tell the genie, hey, when I die, it wouldn't be purgatory. It'd probably be like a nice like home theater or something, right? That I don't own, that the genie owns or whatever. But can you invite me into your home theater and show me my future memories? Your future memories? Yeah. Was it, uh, what? Yes. <laughs> so, 
so th this is my this is my second wish. Uh, and then third wish would be. No, but I don't. I don't understand the second one. And if it's not clear, the genie cannot give it to you. What do you mean it's not clear? Exactly. No, I get to make my decision if I decide to reincarnate on this planet or not, or continue to do my work remotely. Oh. Because I'd still be working, right? I'd still be helping humans out, but I wouldn't be here. So you would like, okay, let me see if I understood. You would like for the genie to show you your future memories, so you can choose whether you want to reincarnate or not. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, but I asked you the three wishes that would help you make these dreams of housing assistance and food assistance reality. Oh, there's a context to the dreams. Yeah, oh, of course. Oh, I thought you meant generically or generally oh. speaking, like broad speaking. No, no, Okay, no. take it all back. Exactly. Okay, so dream, dream one is to have um, a partnership with a developer that also does philanthro uh, philanthropic work or has a trust or... Um, when you say developer, what do you mean? I mean a real estate developer. I mean, oh. I mean someone that, um, okay, there's a, there's a Tony Cho, for example, right? And I know someone that worked on his team for a few years. Um, you met him, actually our roommate. Uh, yeah, you, you remember the guy. He owns like a Burning Man camp or whatever. Um, yeah, so someone from like, like a Tony Cho-ish kind of person or like a Moishi Mana kind of person or like a, uh, one of those Develop. people um, with really hard boundaries, like really, really hard, clear-cut, defined, this is our side, that's your side. What do you mean? What I mean is like they share projected developments for the next five to ten years, and they say, okay, we can allocate in the next five to ten years these many units to this project? To MCR. Okay. And we can make social impact on this level to these many people that would be displaced otherwise, right? Um, so that's the first wish. The first wish is a really great healthy boundary between myself or the MCR team and someone that is currently developing the city of Miami. Okay. Um, yeah. So ideally, you'd like to meet somebody like that. It's not that I'd like to meet them. It's fine if I don't meet the person, but someone from their team that understands and has a holistic approach towards what we're doing. Very you know? clear. Very, yeah. very clear. Awesome. Number two? Uh, number two... Wait, what, the context is just housing assistance? Mm, okay, let me give you another context that could help you. A uh, wish that could help you feel fulfilled when you look back and say, wow, that's the legacy that I helped co-create, that I helped um, become reality, that I helped birth. Feeling like indirectly you have impacted those people's lives thanks to... Okay, so it is broad. This isn't just about housing. Um, has to do with impact. Number two wish would be to create another Red Bull Music Academy. I want for every resident to experience what I experienced at Red Bull Music Academy. What did you experience? I, things that I never thought I'd experience in this life. Like, a, I never thought I'd go to a five-star hotel. I, I, like, I didn't know what that was. So um, they, they, how did it work? Because now it's not a thing anymore, right? They don't have, this, they don't have the same system that they used to have? Yeah, yeah. so Yada Star is a Berlin-based firm uh, conceptual and creative firm, their 20-year contract with Red Bull dissolved. And um, it doesn't exist, but the videos are all publicly available. Pero how did it work? W what happened? You applied for something? Oh, in terms of me? Yeah. Okay, so how this worked back in the day is that you would apply online through Red Bull Music Academy's website uh, to be a participant. And you needed to show your resume, your accomplishments, your original music. And um, you had to fill out approximately 40 pages of documents. Ooh, 40? Um, 40. Okay. Yeah, it was a very long process. Were you accepted the first time you applied? No, I got rejected. And I, I cried for months. And I, I hung the rejection letter above my bed. 
in a frame, a huge frame, a fucking enormous frame. I think it was like a six foot canvas frame. And I just taped, I taped the rejection letter. I printed out the email of Red Bull Music Academy rejecting me and I put it in the center of the wall inside of the frame. I hope this says something about, about him. Uh-huh. And what happened? Did you apply again? You give up? I applied the next year and I got in. Okay. So but I, I spent like maybe 10 hours on that application. Like I made, I proofed, read it like three or four times. Why was it a dream? I don't know. Sometimes you just have a calling and you just do the thing. Like, and you did know, it impact you? It changed my life completely. Okay, so you were saying that your uh, dream would be to have something similar to Red Bull Music Academy? Something better. Something way better, but like that would be the main... So tell me, like, ideally, you wake up today and you have uh, MCR Music Academy 2.0. How does that look like? Well, no, it'd be a syndicate. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have anything to do with MCR. It'd be a larger okay. company that would partner with... XXX um, 2.0 thing. I, I don't know what you're talking about, XXX. XXX. That's a whole like, other topic. I don't know I don't the know. name of the future thing. Oh, right. Okay, so that, <laughs> let's just call it a <laughs> camp or a program. Uh -huh. um, that would be, uh, wait, what was the, what was the question? So the, you, you're asking me the name of it? it? No, no, no. How does it look like? You say better than... Red Bull Music Academy. So how was Red Bull Music Academy and how would what you would like to create better? Well, let me get my sandal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it was great and... I cannot see your face. Can you put this down? Thanks. I have zero viewers here. I don't know what the problem no, is. No, they keep coming and going because they cannot see your face. If you're like People this. are working right now. They don't have... Time to but they can watch this later, so let them see your face. Um, so how was this is very vulnerable. This is a very vulnerable conversation that we're having. I mean, uh, yes. Um, okay, so I can see better. Uh huh. So how was Red Bull Music Academy? They they said, okay, you're accepted, and now you received the ticket. They well, I got my confirmation letter shortly after we met in Spain, and so I was on a fucking island in the middle of the Mediterranean at a Buddhist center <laughs> ready to be a hermit when I got this acceptance confirmation letter. And I was deeply conflicted. You were? Yes. But I knew that I was going to go. I knew that I was going to go. Did he say the time, the day? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So did they give you a flight? They bought the flight. They had a private Escalade that came out. Uh, my name was on that little, yeah. The little what? Little board. It was weird seeing my airport? name on it. Yeah, at the airport. Aww. Someone dressed in all black. Uh, private driver. I, I didn't, I have never felt those uh, emotions and I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Um, okay, so you arrive at what? The hotel? Uh, yeah, so he, he was there. He was waiting for me. I got out of the airport, went inside the car. He dropped me off at the hotel directly uh, in downtown Montreal. And um, really tall ceilings, marble uh, entrance, uh, just very ornate, very godly, very, I, I don't really like those environments, but it was great to experience that at least once in life. Uh, I think it was a treat. And I didn't have to pay for anything. My, my art was what was appreciated. My expression was the reason why I got there, which is a very unique sensation. And they had the funds to provide everything for you. Well, they had the funds because they're a very smart beverage and marketing company. So not only with music, but also mainly with extreme sports, right? Like they are truly visionaries at that hmm. multinational corporation. And they took risks that no other multinational corporation took to invest in industries that were overlooked. That was, oh, there's no profit to be made in skateboarding. There's no profit to be made in BMX. There's no profit to be made in surfing or custom boats okay, flying so off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> so you arrive, you go to the hotel. Um, 
And what happens? Are there other people there? How many people were there? There were other people there. Um, I didn't really talk to anybody. I was in my head most of the time that I was a part of the program, but uh, I made sure to have a lot of sleepless nights and make music and connect with alone? others. Alone, yeah. You were making music alone? Yes, the, for the, the most part, yeah. yeah. I, did, I didn't collaborate with... Like, I spoke to, like, KCMQ. Shout out to KC, it's been a few years. They just put out an album with OK Lou in Paris. Um, Who else did you meet on that trip? I met Thundercat. Uh, I met Dorian Concept. That was really cool uh, to connect with him for a while and talk about Buddhism. Um, did you who hear? Did I, I met so many people. I met Bjork, uh, spoke to her. That's, um, that's kind of like important to mention. Wait, yeah, I mean, I but did you play for did you did you play for Bjork before or after? I played like that open. show. That was a three points show during Basel. Um, I did that after Red Bull Music Academy. Yeah, I opened and closed that that set that show. So going back to the my main question, so you would like something like that for people? Absolutely, I think it would change people's lives in such a deep way. So ideally, give me like an idea, like you would like to, to create or manifest and call in um, like a, a music academy? A music academy that is located an in an arts district uh -huh. in Miami. So either the A&E district, uh, which is closer to downtown or in Wynwood, where there's already an advisory committee uh, not so much a steering committee, but there's politicians on board, there's budgets allocated for cultural arts um, events and cultural affairs programs um, and working with city officials to, to create something where we're working directly with five and four star hotels to have people from all over the world stay in Miami. Um, so, yeah, Combat. but that's, that's kind of inbound. That's not um, just outbound. Does so that what, 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 what that means is that we'd be attracting people to Miami. It wouldn't be just like creating the platform for Miami residents. So very um, similar to the lighthouse, there would need to be an inclusion ratio, right? So it'd be like 50% people from the tri-county area and 50% of people internationally, mm. right? Or 20, 80 or, or 30, 70. So um, would you like to have like a, a network? of places like that around the world or just Miami? We're working on that now. Yeah, but that, the second wish would be to create something like that, a program like that. Um, Estimate time of arrival? I'm gonna give myself three years. I'm gonna give myself two or three years for that one. That, that's, a, that's a big one, that's fucking huge. Well, uh, I would like to ask the people that are present here on Instagram, um, and those that are watching this to leave their comments and to ask their questions in case there is any question that you'd like to ask Nick, I'm here to ask um, him the questions. So I wanted to ask you something else before we finish here and while we wait for the question, which is, do you think, so first of all, how did fatherhood, so becoming a father impacted you? Do I get my third wish before I answer this question? Oh, I thought it was to liberate the genie, the genie, no? Okay, you get the third wish, yes. The third wish would to pretty much partner to have a multi-purpose warehouse like this one. Um, oh yeah, because we didn't talk about the second location, the third location. Right. Okay, let's go there. Let's, before you go to the third, the third wish. So after starting MCR at the house, what was the second location? Do you wanna talk about can it? I, can I address the third wish and then we can talk okay, about the second location? All right, all right. So the third wish would be having MCR residents that own small businesses also have their commercial leases in the same building. So residents, they would live on the floors above and the first floor would be... That's cool. Yeah. So, okay. so explain that clearly, clearly so that I can see everything that you're saying. So you would have like commercial building, you said? So it's the same rollout of what's happening right now, specifically in Wynwood, 
uh, where it's first floor commercial, then everything above it is residential. Maybe they have a few floors for parking. Um, so MCR residents would live in the building, but their businesses, those that qualify and that own small businesses, their businesses would be on the first floor. It's so like River Landing, for example, that right, new right. development along the Miami River. First floor is Publix. Second floor is like Ross and TJ Maxx and like all these different like companies. And but, it, but it's mainly having, parking, but then at a certain point, it's all residential. So instead of having those big brands, having the small businesses. Okay, now it's clear. Exactly. So that's the third wish. That's the third wish, yeah. And there would be a plaza area, there'd be a common area, there'd be like a, yeah. But that's like a major development. Like that we would need to have really great partners and we'd have to, like it's not a small, yeah. So the difference between, um, you remember that I said that I didn't know that the fresh market thing was going to become a thing? And yeah. it became a thing? Yeah. It's because I didn't know, and also MCR became a thing, because I didn't know that it was going to, you were going to pour, pour so much work into it. So now I know that it is going to happen because I know you and the amount of work that you put on a daily basis towards these projects. Work in terms of hours, energy. Energy is equal to work, um, action, movement towards those things, uh, research, um, connections, and the. I know that it's going to happen also because it's not a thing that you're just doing for yourself, which is always what's going to work. When you're working for humanity in some level and degree, the doors are always going to open. So... Anyway, so you want to talk about the second location and third location where we are now? Yeah. Okay, so after um, I basically kicked you out of there, of the house, um, because of the baby and the music and stuff, where did you guys go? We went to the shotgun office, Who located you? in Little River. Who introduced you to those people? That, well, those people um, are people that I love very much and uh, that I care about very much. But those people are Charlie and Priscilla. So I had two meetings with Charlie. We connected for a very long time, for many hours, and uh, eventually spoke to Priscilla. Same situation. On the phone with her once for four hours straight not just about business. We actually talked about business for a very short part of our conversation. Interesting to mention that. And uh, it shows that relationships and connection matters the most, not business. Business is a very small portion of building with people. So anyways, went to the shotgun office pretty much just because of them too, no one else. So the shotgun team, for all intents and purposes, in my eyes, was Priscilla and Charlie. So everyone else I can't really speak on behalf of because I didn't really get to know those people. Um, yeah, nor, nor did I really want to connect with them, to be honest. Yes, if you have questions, just ask them in the comment, and I will ask Nick before we finish the show. Uh -huh. So you connected with them, and they allowed you to stay there? You went to visit the office? Do you yep. have a walkthrough? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, we had a walk through. We were kind of feeling things out a little bit to see if it would make sense. And it was another kind of experimental agreement, lease agreement that we had with them. Um, yeah. For how long? There was no actual definitive time for us to be in this space, which was actually a benefit, but it was a part of the problem, mainly because they're a multinational corporation. So their headquarters so are in Paris. So how long did you stay there? How long did you stay there? We for? stood there for about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. And then what happened? How did you come to the third space? Um, and where is it? And yeah. So our it? agreement in the last space pretty much ended. Um, when? Through mutual agreement. Uh, th that was December of last year. So we're looking at four months ago. And. Um, yeah, we ended up in this space uh, through the graciousness of Sarah, which she is in the room right now. Uh, respect and gratitude to Sarah for letting us be here. How did you meet Sarah? 
we met Sarah, I met Sarah, um, at the shotgun office during Banavis Young's um, show, f during their MCR show. And we, you know, we connected after their show. And I'll never forget that conversation because of, again, how deep it was and how we kind of said, we'll finish it at a different moment in time and we never ended up <laughs> finishing it. Um, but it just had to do with like a lot of really amazing stuff like spirituality and, and intimacy and society and um, just very all-encompassing. And, um, and at the end of the conversation, Sarah was like, oh yeah, we'll have a space. She's like totally in passing, very similar to Priscilla. Like it's a very like small part of um, the combo. Yeah, the conversation. So we ended up here because I was talking to Philip Mauricio, and we had a list of about eight different spots that we were considering. And uh, dear Eleanor was pretty much um, one of the main main choices on that list of small businesses that we wanted to to partner with, and here we are. So it's a bigger space. It feels freer. How do you feel here? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the size is something that we were really, that we were focused on. I think it was more like the depth of the connection and like the partnership itself. And so this is just a fucking incredible relationship and connection. It's so flowing and it's completely different from working with a multinational corporation. Uh, or, and I'm not gonna, you know, bring into question the structure of board members and investors and like all the different complexities behind a multinational corporation, shareholder culture, um, how equity is distributed. It's just very different when it's a small business to small business partnership and relationship. I think everyone should know what this feels like as a small business owner to partner with other small businesses. Hence, Panavision, right? Shout out to Annette and Clary, like major respect to the both of them for their mission statement and what they're doing for Miami. Because uh, we would literally not be here in this space um, through Sarah's grace had it not been for the both of them. So thank you for the work that, that you both do as well. So some words that you would give to somebody that has like an idea, um, that has something that they're trying to create and they feel like they don't know where to start, how to connect, or how to, like, for example, you said that you have had experimental agreements with places. I don't know if you want to talk about that um, or just in general giving some, some advice to people that are like, oh, I would like to do that I, or something like this or I have this idea, but I don't know where to start to talk about it with people. I don't know if it's clear what I asked you. Yeah, but I, I want to answer your other question about how fatherhood impacted me first, and then I'll answer this one. Dale. So fatherhood made me wake the fuck up, and like, not so much about like the predominant thought in Western world, which is like provider, uh, financial pillar, like not like the patriarch, like no, like not like from that angle at all. More so like, who am I? Like really going into like, what is this incarnation about? Why am I on this planet? How am I contributing? What values am I gonna give this little person? And how free do I want them to be in their own radical expression of life, right? That, that's what I mean by like, it woke me up, right? It's like, how much am I embodying or integrating my values? So maybe if we didn't have Hermes, then we, you know, we, I wouldn't be using bartering agreements for services. Um, I wouldn't have stepped into that power, right? So I, I think parenthood is very powerful. You just need to be very intentional and conscious about it. Um, and really, there's no perfect time. Sorry. Uh, if you're thinking about having a kid or something, there is literally no perfect time for it. So you can... What would you say to those that would say, like, how about, what about, like, taking care of them or providing for them or... You know, I'm scared that I that I don't even know who I am and I don't know what I'm doing and how can I be there for somebody that I'm supposed to be caring for if I don't even can provide for myself. Those are all valid thoughts. Just don't have sex. Good luck. <laughs> um, I also think personally that having that baby brings back a sense of community within the family. 
because we are so we we think like okay now it's my baby i need to take care of this baby and you know uh, i cannot ask for help and in reality it's the opposite i need to learn to ask for help because we are here to help one another and actually it allows for people to love you and help you in ways that they wouldn't be able to if they do not know what you need and how they can support you and, and help you. So I think that also is important because we've been trying to, to do it on our own and it is, it is hard. It, it, the fact that it takes a village is, uh, is real. Here he goes. Oh, speak of the... The speak baby. Of the one. Speak of the baby. Um, you want you want me to get him, or do you want to get him? No, I'm gonna get him. But what was the other question that we were talking about? How fatherhood impacted you? Yeah. Well, the, I I addressed that. I answered that one. Um, there was another one. The other one had to do with. <laughs> um, we're just bouncing around with questions a lot. There so was one. Let me see if there are questions here. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Thank you, everybody that connected live. Let me see, they're just saying hello. All right, do you have questions in the audience? What does your typical day look like? What is your typical day look like, she's asking. Yeah, so Monday we're here, then uh, pretty much I get here in the morning and then depending on Sylvia's schedule, like whether she has clients or not, um, she comes or she stays at home. It's, it really depends on her. But yeah, we do operations here. And then ideally I do early shift and then either Phil or Money she'll come in and they do late shift. Um, and then I go home and I get to give him a bath or help. Wait, wait, she, wants to, she wanted something more specific. Oh yeah, what, what did you, yeah. Yeah, I, so the question is, do I have like a morning ritual or routine? Absolutely not. I like totally not. Um, I have this really bad habit of like showering like twice a week. Um, I don't know. Like I'm, 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 I'm just like a hippie, hippie van lifer kind of like, I don't know. I'm going to respond for you. Okay. Um, we wake up around 8, 7.38 and then... We make cacao. Usually that's our routine. Um, then we make bref breakfast. And then um, he stays with the baby while I'm preparing something. Or then he washes the dishes. And then he drops me off at the office where I usually have sessions between 10 and 12. And he stays with the baby and plays with him and then puts him to sleep. I go back home. I prepare lunch. And his free time in between, he's always on the computer searching for something. Um, and then we have lunch when the baby wakes up. While he's asleep, usually, you know, prepare lunch and then just finish what we can finish on the computer. And then we wake up, he, wake up, he wakes up from uh, his nap and we go to a park. We go to the park every day. Yesterday we went to the park twice, in the morning and in the afternoon. So we make sure that we are giving him quality time. So we stay at the park, one hour, two hours. Whatever, we go back, we have our night routine, um, which involves him taking a bath, sometimes with me, sometimes with him, and then preparing dinner, having dinner while watching a movie or something, and then putting him to sleep. And then uh, he stays up between 10 and 4 a.m. the other day until 5 a.m. just researching, and then goes back, goes back to sleep, and four hours later, the morning starts again. So that is the ritualistic, you know, with yeah. some flexibility. I, I was just, thank you for that. It was very comprehensive. Um, I think like the magic happens during the witching hour for me personally, and uh, which is between the hours of like 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Um, to my detriment, especially like as a husband and as a father, because no one likes to sleep in a bed alone when you have a family. Um, and, but yeah, I need to kind of limit myself where it's like, how many of these nights am I going to have a week? Sometimes it's just like once a week or it's like twice a week. 
but it's it's not like three times a week or four times a week. I think at that point it's like too invasive. Um, yeah, but that's we have to find a compromise there. We have to find a compromise because I was like, basically, I'm gonna shoot you in the foot, in the foot, if you. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's not true. Um, like, we need to find a compromise. That cannot happen every time. But now I feel like we're flowing much better. And uh, he does take those times to research, which are very important, because otherwise nothing of what is being created would have been created. Because he needs that moment of focus that we cannot have when we have the baby around, because we love him so much that we're always there as soon as he calls us. So we have two minutes left, three minutes left, and any last thoughts that you'd like to share with us today as if it was the last words that you have available in this incarnation to share with the world? The, world that you're, the words that you're gonna be reminded by. I'm shaking in my boots. Um, just like know thyself. Like, don't fall for the snares and traps of, like, things like organized religion or superstructures um, or genealogical programming. Like, repair your fucking DNA. <laughs> like, we have the internet. There, there are many ways to heal your DNA, but, like, just be yourself. Like, just... And then try to integrate that, try to embody that. It doesn't matter if you trip and you see the universe inverted and you experienced all 500 of your lives, past lives. What, I mean, what are you going to do with that information? It's like, now what? what you know, you come back into your body, you're sober a day or two later. Um, give me the potion. Give me the magic trick, the magic pill to be yourself. What helped you being yourself? And what's the magic pill? Crisis, suffering, and enlightenment. I think, and you can't, you can't do it to yourself. It just kind of needs to happen. And you need to be prepared for it at all times. Um, you also need to be very careful with how you react to things. You should try not to overreact. Um, but yeah, try not to overreact to things. Try to contemplate and reflect as much as possible and understand that the suffering is a part of the enlightenment. And um, it's temporary. Even the enlightenment is temporary. You meet one person on the street, you talk to them for five minutes, and you realize everything that you thought you knew about society and life is just wrong. <laughs> so... Is there something else that helped you in your enlightenment path? I thought we were finishing up. Yes, we have 30 seconds. Psychedelics. What's that? Uh, hallucinogens. In what form did they help? All forms, artificial and organic. No, no, but in what way, sorry? In every way. It helped me in every way. So. Dissolving you? Refragmenting you? How? Um, recalibrating me. Re resetting, yeah. Well, I think uh, if I could speak on behalf of you, I would say that the magic pill is ideas and then integrating that, applying them, and um, practice. So it's theory plus practice equal success, whatever success means to us. Um, a lot of people know what they need to do, and a lot of people do not do what they know that they need to do, and then there are people that know what they need to do, and they do it, and that's the difference between successful and unsuccessful. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. I think this was very useful for me as well to understand your ideas and your visions, and uh, also for people, and also for the universe to know what is that you're calling in um, moving forward, so that the universe can be like, knock, knock, here you go. This is what you were looking for. Thank you. Thanks. Final words? No? Stand by. Stand by to the camera. My camera. <laughs>